Eka mana, eka reo, eka moka whakahi, eka awawa, eka pōtaka o ka tauka tuku iho, uh, tēnā koutou. Ko waio, ko David Merak tāko ingoa, uh, ko uh, o te tumi whakarai o te whare wananga o tāko, uh, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou tātoua. Just realised, sorry about that, it's really the microphone <laughs> in the right place. <laughs> Um, for those who don't know me, um, my name is David Murdoch, I'm the Vice-Chancellor at, at the University of Otago and a really a great pleasure to be here at the, the celebration of uh, Peter Adams' promotion to Professor and I must say these are, um, of all the tasks I have, these are one of the most pleasurable ones to be involved in, in these events. And uh, as you're probably aware, we've had quite a disruption over the last few years with COVID um, and a lot of these inaugural professorial lectures we have had cancelled or, or put off. And, uh, and so it's great to be back in the swing of things. And in fact, we've got four this week, alone three in Dunedin and, and one in, in, uh, in uh, Christchurch. So it's, it's, it's wonderful to be back. And of course, um, we have them, we're beaming them online as well as in person. So I think it's increased the, um, the ability of people to attend, which is fantastic. Um, my main role is really just to um, to welcome everybody here today. And I know we have, uh, welcome everyone here who's here in person, uh, welcome everyone who's joining online, um, either live or, or later on. Uh, those part of the, the wider university community, part of the wider Dunedin community. But uh, especially um, want, want to uh, acknowledge Peter's Fano and friends. And I gather today we, uh, Peter's parents, Jeff and Helen Adams are here, wonderful. Um, uh, Peter's partner Tony and son Owen I think are also here, wonderful to see you here. Uh, sister Gillian and partner Richard um, and then I understand that may be joining by live stream from Wellington uh, Peter's daughter Harriet and there may be brother from Sydney joining um, uh, uh, but the live stream as well. So welcome to everybody, great to have you here. Now I'm going to leave it to, to Anthony to give a, a more detailed um, uh, introduction to, to Peter and Peter's biography. But I guess I just um, always like to see if there's some point of contact. I think the main point of contact that I have with Peter is the fact that a large proportion of my family go to his summer schools every year. And I hear about them <laughs> repeatedly and have never attended, but I uh, hear a lot about them and they're clearly highly, highly successful. Um, uh, congratulations, Peter, on this really well-deserved promotion. Um, I'm somebody who can't imagine living without music, and so I'm really, really keen to hear your lecture today, very much looking forward to it, and I'll hand over to, to Anthony to give a bit more detail about your career. So, no reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Right. Yeah, kia ora koutou, everybody, and... Um, it's lovely to be introducing my old friend Peter Adams to this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so used to these things that you forget about them. Uh, it's, been, it's lovely to be introducing my old friend uh, Peter tonight um, for his IPL. I've been uh, colleagues with Peter for over 30 years, and we've shared the common interests of composition and conducting. I first encountered Peter uh, in the National Youth Choir way back in 1979, <laughs> when the choir first started. Uh, sadly, I didn't get to know him at that point because the choir was very tribal. You either belonged to the Christchurch tribe or the Dunedin tribe. Or <laughs> um, however, a few years later, I got to see him conduct the Christchurch Youth Orchestra. You may not be aware of this, and I, I remember thinking at the time, there's a sprightly, intelligent-looking character with a fine head of hair. <laughs> ah, thanks. <laughs> um, and a few years later, I moved to Dunedin to become Mozart Fellow, and so began a long friendship with Peter, who was an assistant, a research assistant at the time in the music department. And he's been an integral part of what was the music department and has become the School of Performing Arts since the 1980s. He made an outstanding contribution both as a teacher and a musical leader. He's really been the glue that's held the department's curriculum together over three years of change. And I'd hazard a guess that he's possibly taught uh, more on more papers than anyone else in the university. 
Um, he's played pivotal roles in uh, music technology, music theory, composition, music history, music aesthetics, and I could go on. He's been an important uh, conduit for our wind and brass performance students, himself being a top quality clarinetist who could have had a career as a, uh, a professional performer should he have chosen that path. He's had important leadership roles in the school and his style has always been collaborative, no fuss, getting the job done efficiently and effectively. Um, I, his knowledge of degree structures and course approval is second to none. <laughs> I am constantly amazed how he calmly answers any inquiry I have about a student path. <laughs> his cheerful nature is much appreciated by the staff and the students, and he's always willing to help. He helped out last year when I was, uh, when I was ill, so he's very, a very collegial person. He's also open-minded by nature and happy to explore new options. And way back in the 1990s, he was a willing party to developing the music technology uh, stream, which, as it was called back then, which has become a very important pathway for us now, known, known as music production. Peter's been a major figure in the wider music community. He's well known nationally and internationally as a conductor in the brass band world, with a highlight being a tour to China with the National Youth Brass Band. He's also led the local St Kilda Brass Band, becoming national champions. His concerto for violin and brass band was a world first in 2007. <laughs> yeah. Very unusual combination. Um, Peter's also worked for the uh, Dunedin Symphony Orchestra as a conductor and clarinetist. The City Choir he's conducted, New Zealand Secondary Schools, uh, Dunedin Youth. He's had a big role with young people over the years. And he's been a mainstay of the Waitaki Music Summer Music School for many years. I think it's also Peter's generous nature that's greatly appreciated. He's very willing to give his time to fellow musicians. So much so that on occasions he's had to be in two places at once. <laughs> uh, but this is a skill that musicians develop as they get older. <laughs> in recent years, uh, his composition gained the recognition it deserves. Uh, via performances, recordings and publications, including recordings with Rattle Records. He's not been one to push his own barrow, but he's written some top quality works that could stand alongside the best that Aotearoa has to offer. Um, I remember some years ago driving home at night and hearing some beautiful music on the radio and I thought, gosh, that's subtle and nicely scored and simple, yet rich. Um, and it turned out to be Peter's quartet, Look to the Far Horizon, which I think we might hear a little bit of tonight. And uh, Peter's music demonstrates some distinctive qualities, uh, southern identity, I think, in my opinion, a certain understated quality uh, with evocations of landscape and culture from this part of the world. However, it also springs from an intellectual tradition that appreciates music for its own sake and for its scientific foundations, as Peter will explain. Peter feels strongly that the best music is not simply entertainment or a comfort blanket. It engages with us intellectually and emotionally and is an essential part of being human. Hence the title of his talk tonight, Why Music Matters to Me and Why It Should Matter to You. Peter will take us far back in history and demonstrate the important role that music has played in philosophy and learning, how imagination is a key element in music's function and how his life and music connects with these ideas. So we look forward to it greatly, um, Peter, no, uh, mihi nui, and um, now I'm just going to ask the staff of the School of Performing Arts to come down and we're going to sing our school waiata. I hope there's a few of them. <laughs> As you wish, as you wish. Yeah. Te manu, te manu, 
Kiora, colleagues, Kiora, Professor Murdoch, and Kiora Anthony. Kiora Tatao, uh, Otawiki, Otawiki Otareo Māori, uh, Kei Akunui, Ka Akurahi, Ka Mihi, Tihi, Kei Atu, Kei Aku, sorry, Kei Akoto Kato. Uh, Kei uh, Hei Pākaha, oh, uh, Ko Araki Tamaonga, Ko Waitaki Te Awa, Kei te nohu o ki o te poti, ko Adams te whana, ko Peter aho, kei te kahuito a mani aha. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou kato. Ki ora. Welcome to you all, especially to my colleagues, to my family, to my friends, to the wider university community, to the mu musical community of Dunedin. I really appreciate your attendance and support tonight. Thank you very much. Ki ora. I'd like to begin with a quote uh, from Paul McCartney. In music, there's a lot of magic in what we do. There's a lot of mystery that you can't explain. And he's right, there's so much that is mysterious about music. Is it a language? And if it is, what does it say? And how does it say it? I know of no other substance or artifact that we respond to intellectually, emotionally, sensually, and physically in equal measure and all simultaneously. The beat and rhythm makes us move and dance, harmonies touch us emotionally, um, the brain perceives patterns, hierarchies, organization, and as we will see, music especially feeds our imagination. We know that music is universal, it's been part of human culture for many thousands of years. The first instruments we know of were simple bone flutes, discovered in Germany dating from 43,000 years before present. The exact origins of music remains obscure though, with commentators in disagreement over whether it rose before or after or simultaneously with the origins of human language. Most cultures have their own mythical uh, origins concerning the invention of music, generally rooted in their respective mythological, religious or philosophical beliefs. So if we're unsure when music began, we seem just as unclear about music's function. So let me talk about that a little bit, because we live in a society that puts music into the arts and entertainment section of the newspaper. And actually serious music has very little to do with entertainment. In fact, it's almost the opposite. Music works on the imagination. It's an art form that's perceived by the ears and not the eyes, and this is a vital distinction. The brain does not hear music as representing something in the way it does visually with visual and literary arts. So we can't compose music, Anthony and I and others, that is a tree, a nude, or a teapot. Music bypasses the representational and it inhabits the world of what Schopenhauer called the inner experience, or the imagination. Plato and the ancient Greeks called it the soul. So let's trigger your imaginations for a minute. I'd like to begin with some music, the piece that Anthony actually was mentioning, the opening of my 2015 string quartet, Look to the Far Horizon. It's performed by the Jade String Quartet of Auckland, recorded on a Rattle Records CD entitled Parlour Games. This music does not represent anything. The word I like is evokes. I hope this music 
will evoke certain moods and certain characters. It might recall associations with places, landscapes, other music. Every listener will have their own internal response. I was thinking of bleached skies um, uh, when I wrote that, and I was also setting out the ingredients of the piece uh, in those opening minutes. Well, the first people to really understand how music works were the ancient Greeks. The Greeks said that music and astronomy were two sides of the same coin. Astronomy was seen as the study of relationships between observable external objects and music was seen as the study of relationships between invisible, temporary, hidden, internal objects within us. Plato himself devotes substantial attention to music in both the Republic and laws, conceiving of music as an art that can bypass reason and the intellect and penetrate into our innermost self, impacting even the constitution of our character. To use Plato's two terms, music acts as a charm on our inner life, shaping this life to its pattern. And I think Shakespeare also had insight into this charm of music, the famous passage from The Merchant of Venice, the man that hath no music in himself, nor is not moved with concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treason, stratagems, and spoils. Music and astronomy found themselves the basis for the quadrivium, the upper division of the medieval education in the liberal arts, which consisted of four related subjects, as they saw it, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Nom number, of course, being the common denominator amongst these subjects. As I've said, astronomy looks out at observable, near-ageless phenomena, the stars and the planets that have been there for an eternity, while music looks inward at invisible, perceived with the ear, not the eye, remember, temporal internal objects within us. The quadrivium curriculum led people to see the relations between things, uh, helping to overcome the old opposition between humanities and sciences, the physics and mathematics of the natural order of things, the natural world, underpins both music and astronomy, as Pythagoras, of course, showed. 
Music is as much a science as it is an art, and therefore you can understand why a university is a university when we have such subjects in the curriculum. Music intersects and balances the relationship between the humanities and the sciences, and as Plato saw it, the four areas of the, quadrivi of the quadrivium each contribute to the formation and ordering of what he called the soul. And it is this mysterious world of inner experience and imagination that music feeds, and why, to me, it is so important and matters so much. Here in the music program of this university, we focus not just on the study of music, but on the practice of it. It's one thing to think about music historically and culturally, to describe it and to analyze it, and we do that, of course. But to practice music is what has happened for centuries, and that's what we try to do here, help our students in the practice of music. My friends and colleagues in the School of Performing Arts are practitioners distinguished performers, composers, songwriters, and producers. And I do what I do, make music and assist others in making it, because it turns out it's the thing that I seem to be best at. Being visually impaired with the genetic eye condition retinitis pigmentosa, I can't trust my eyes as much as I can trust my ears, although my partner would probably disagree with that statement. <laughs> and she would say that I have that uh, growing male trait of um, selective deafness. <laughs> music is a language that has always spoken very clearly to me. The paradox is that it's not translatable, but it provokes and it stimulates the imagination that is in its way as powerful as any drug. My own practice started as a young boy. I came from a musical family, my parents loved music, my father was a hi-fi buff, and the stereo would be on with a Catholic mix of classical, jazz, and popular musics. Everything from Sidney Bechet to Gene Sibelius to Carly Simon. There has been research to show that exposure to music in the first five years of life is crucial to the development of musicality. And this saturation in music was crucial, I think, for my sisters and myself. My uncle Glynn was a world-class viola player. He became principal viola of the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra and then moved over to the London Symphony Orchestra in the days when it was conducted by Andre Previn. My parents encouraged my sisters and myself to learn instruments. The girls took up violin, and so of course I had to do something different. I took up the clarinet and saxophone. Nearly always, the first foray into music for most of us is through performance. Creating music as a composer or songwriter seems to come later. Learning the language of music first through practice on an instrument or through singing underpins creativity. In our family, this exposure to music bore fruit. My sister Gillian was an accomplished violinist who later sang in choirs. The youngest, Miranda, is a professional violinist, associate concertmaster of the Auckland Philharmonia Orchestra. My parents are here tonight uh, Jeff and Helen, Jeff whose long career at the, at, uh, in the newspaper took him to editor of the Otago Daily Times, and Mum who had a very uh, long nursing career. And I want to thank them particularly for their support and their encouragement of all of our family's music, and for always checking also that we kids did our practice. <laughs> thank you. Growing up here in Dunedin, I started clarinet with Wes Faulkner, a wonderful Dunedin musician who used to be the musical director of the capping shows. I showed an aptitude for the instrument and uh, quite quickly, so lessons often consisted of us playing through, of all things, Irish jigs, as well as sight reading most of his jazz arrangements. My best friend was Trevor Coleman. Some of you will know Trevor. He has a, a DMA from this university, uh, Emmy nominated composer. Well, he and I were, grew up together in St. Clair. He lived around the corner. We hung out together all the time. And we both learnt instruments at Saturday morning music classes. In the early 1970s, we entered into the Caroline Bay Talent Contest in Timaru. <laughs> this was our first ever public performance, preserved here for posterity in this photograph. We were very excited to go through to the finals. We were shouted fish and chips for that feat. <laughs> What masterpiece did we play? Herb Alpert's Tijuana Taxi. <laughs> Trevor and I both attended King's High School, where we came under the influence of the very charismatic music master, Peter Warwick, 
who also, also taught history. He might have ta taught Tony Ballantyne, actually, and I'm not sure. <laughs> he was the epitome of cool, long-haired and owner of a Ford Capri, posters of which adorned the music room walls. He identified talented musical boys as third formers and took us out of art class and gave us extra music, essentially hothousing this little group and guiding us to school certificate and then university entrance music. He ran a school orchestra and a brass band and he was instrumental in developing my passion for music. Having a musical family around me and having completed bursary music at school, the idea of becoming a musician didn't seem strange. In fact, I never really considered any other career path. So I studied music here at Otago University and did an honours degree in clarinet performance and in composition. The department, as it was then in those days, was small but thriving under the professorship of John Drummond. John, Jack Spears, Patrick Little and John Barker nurtured my musical interests and inspired and motivated me uh, to continue my music. I found that I enjoyed composition um, at university and an early piece, Sings Daphne, that set the words of Janet Frame from Owls Do Cry, won the Philip Neal Memorial Prize in composition. By this time I'd been playing clarinet in the Dunedin Youth Orchestra and then the Dunedin Civic Orchestra, as it was called in those days, and I'd been teaching at the Saturday morning music classes. There, the music director, the human dynamo that is Art Brusser, um, asked me to assist him in conducting the senior orchestra, and this was my first step into conducting, an area that I've embraced uh, for over 40 years through to the present day. You'll forgive me, but I was conducting a brass band from Invercargill in the Otago Southland Championships on Sunday, and I'm conducting the local St Kilda brass band in a concert this coming Sunday. Uh, pardon the pluck. Um, Art Brusser taught me the galvanising value of energy and enthusiasm. If we are contagious with these, it rubs off onto our students, onto our musicians, and onto people who we deal with. It's always been my philosophy uh, to have that energy and enthusiasm. My undergraduate degree had exposed me to performing, composing, conducting, and to contemporary art music. And now the time had come to think about specialising. Most of my musical friends went overseas to continue their performance studies at music conservatories, and I was tempted to do this. But I had also decided that I wanted a broader musical career in a university music department if possible. Jack Spears was my role model. As a lecturer here, he was able to continue to mix conducting, performing on his instrument, composing, teaching, and analyzing music. And I consider myself extremely fortunate to have been taught by him and then to have been sort of his replacement in a sense and to be able to do exactly the same myself. Commonwealth and William Giorgetti scholarships took me to London and King's College where I did a master's degree in music theory and in analysis. Um, the 80s were a bit of a wild time and uh, <laughs> I want my colleagues to particularly note the hair, long gone and also the appalling taste in mustard-coloured clothing. Uh, that was the 80s for you. This master's degree gave me the tools to penetrate beneath the surface of a piece of music, to understand its organisation, its cellular growth, and its coherence. All very useful in score preparation as a conductor and later for tertiary level teaching. I remained in London for nearly five years. I began a PhD at King's on the chromatic harmony of Frederick Delius, wonderful composer, but it got put aside as my freelance career gained some traction. I conducted a choir of former music students in London, played clarinet, freelancing in many little ad hoc orchestras that were put together to go out and accompany the many choral societies scattered around the south of England. And I also taught some clarinet and saxophone in several schools. In the summer of 1982 and 1983, I attended the famous Dartington Summer Music School, where I spent an intensive fortnight studying composition with Peter Maxwell Davies and conducting with John Carew. John Carew was the, the teacher of Simon Rattle, so he had a good pedigree, if you like. Max, as he was known, was something of a cult figure in the British contemporary music scene, and his classes were very stimulating, but also intimidating. 
His intense glare would often put you on the spot as he waited interminably for an answer to a complex question. My sonata for clarinet and viola was the result of my study with Max. Written in 1983 for New Zealand performers in London that I had known back in New Zealand through the National Youth Orchestra, clarinetist Rachel Vernon and violist John Rogers. It was premiered at New Zealand House on the Haymarket. The work was quickly recorded a year later back home by Radio New Zealand. The extract I want to play you now was recorded more recently in 2015 as part of the ReSound project, a project re-recording New Zealand works of importance, and it again features my good friend Rachel on the clarinet and the late Peter Barbara, Barber on viola. The work is both lyrical and angular, dissonant and expressionist, reflecting the ni early 1980s, the time it was written, and the influence of Peter Maxwell Davies. that's rather like looking at an old photograph in which you don't quite recognize yourself. Um, that's not a long, long time ago, uh, and uh, uh, almost a different language uh, to me. Um, that New Zealand house performance of my, of my sonata was one of the first occasions that I had taken out a young Englishwoman, Tony Plant. As a rock chick, she was not very impressed with my piece and my dissonant modern musical language, but she continued to go out with me nevertheless, so I was a winner. In 1987, we returned together to Dunedin. I had some part-time work at the university and as an itinerant woodwind teacher in the schools, along with some private music teaching. The sort of portfolio musician, actually, that we are training our students to become today. We settled, and in 1990, I began my full-time full career here at the university, after getting the position of assistant lecturer in music, the very first rung on the academic ladder in those days. Here is my application photo taken by Tony. As you can see, I was doing my best brooding intense look, <laughs> if I could. Uh, 1990 at this university, no internet, no email, no cell phones. The Vice Chancellor, Robin Irvine, sent cards out on our birthdays. Very different times. <laughs> it was truly a pleasure for me to work alongside my previous teachers here in the department and to be part of a very significant transformation in music education led by John Drummond as we first embraced the academic study of popular music, and I can remember Elizabeth Kerr denouncing this on Radio New Zealand, uh, that universities would soon be studying popular literature, heaven forbid, <laughs> and other things. Uh, and then after popular music, we brought in our courses on music technology, and then finally, of course, courses in contemporary rock performance and songwriting, introducing the first contemporary popular music degree in the entire Southern Hemisphere in 2000. You should remember that. Everyone's copied us since. You can go anywhere and learn electric guitar, but in 2000, we were the first in the whole Southern Hemisphere, and one of the, only a, about a, a dozen in the world. 
So the 1990s were an extremely busy time for me. I'd returned to Dunedin when, uh, when several long-standing community organisations were actually looking for musical direction. Very quickly, I found myself conducting the City Choir Dunedin that was then known as the Scholar Cantorum, the Dunedin Youth Orchestra, and the Dunedin Symphonia, as the Dunedin Symphony Orchestra was then known. Orchestras and other centres wanted my services, and then the St Kilda Brass Band came knocking on my door, an association that's continued to this day. After that, Opera Otago came to the party, and I frequently found myself out three or four nights a week, rehearsing while working here by day and bringing up a young family along with Tony. Over my career, I seem to have conducted more than 400 performances, with ensembles that range from youth orchestras to choirs, professional orchestras to brass bands, opera companies to musical theatre groups. All this tells you is I find it hard to say no. As Anthony mentioned, I especially like working with young people, and I've also really enjoyed leading 14 annual Waitaki summer music camps, organised by my good friend Paul Clayman and Professor Tim Wilkinson. Let's take a moment to look at this practice of conducting. For many years, my primary research was my professional practice as a conductor. And a conductor in performance, of course, has got one of the most visible uh, jobs in the world, uh, but despite this, many people are rather baffled by what, they by what they actually do. What difference is the conductor making? Answering that question is difficult because conductors do so many things, both on and off the podium. In fact, the role of the conductor is always evolving. How we think of a conductor now didn't develop uh, until the early 20th century, long after Mozart, Beethoven and Bach had passed. There are plenty of stereotypes uh, in, uh, surrounding conductors. They're dictatorial, egotistical, mysterious, old, elitist, almost exclusively male. However, these stereotypes are increasingly out of date. There are now a growing number of female conductors, New Zealanders leading the way in this regard, with our own ex-student Holly M. Atherson prominent and Gemma New just appointed the first ever female uh, musical director of the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra. There's also been a lot of important work done recently to disrupt and dispel these stereotypes. Conductors will not get away with abuse, rudeness or negativity. They are one cog in a complex machine that goes to making a satisfying performance. And in the 21st century, they need to work collaboratively and collegially with their fellow musicians. And to illustrate this, here is a clip I show my conducting students. I ask them, what is happening here? What's going on? And I apologize, it's fairly low quality. I get some interesting answers from my students. Um, some will tell me, he told them to deliberately come in on my fourth rebound. <laughs> Others will say, no, he, he started before they were ready, and so on. But finally, we actually get to the point. This conductor has done something to upset this orchestra. You might have noticed they weren't smiling. None of them were tapping their, their bows or applauding as he entered. Um, and therefore, they don't actually come in when he directs them to. They make a fool of him. Beethoven V opens with that famous three-note motive, and it comes after a rebound, after literally a vigorous kickoff. Ba ba ba, ba ba ba. Can you imagine the shock of not having that rebound <laughs> when you expect it? And he's, he's left, floundering. This orchestra were reminding the conductor where the real power lies. <laughs> A great lesson for all of us. So at a basic level, conducting is very simple. The timekeeping aspect keeps an orchestra or a choir in time and together. 
regulatory gestures, control dynamics and balances, looks and other gestures, cue players for entrances after many bars of inactivity, and so on. But that's just the starting point. Most importantly, a conductor serves as a messenger for the composer. It's their responsibility to understand the music and to convey it through gesture so that the musicians in the ensemble understand perfectly. Those musicians can then transmit a unified vision of the music out to the audience, many individual voices, as it were, becoming one unified voice. In the 18th century, conductors and leaders used a big staff that they would pound on the ground to keep musicians in time. This was quite effective in one sense, everyone could hear it, but then the composer Lully stabbed himself in the foot, got gangrene and died. So people began to look for a better way to do it. So nowadays, conductors use either a baton or just their hands. There are many set patterns and gestures which communicate key features of the music universally understood. Over the years, the job has developed into something which is primarily artistic, to integrate the musical interpretations of all the musicians on stage into a bigger picture. So the conductor develops their gesture to shape the music, a skill which involves psychology, body language, knowledge of music history and style, a sensitivity actually to everything that makes us human. It's a bit more than just waving your arms around. In rehearsal, the conductor acts as a sort of guide and teacher. We rehearse to play the music well and in a unified way, especially when it's new or difficult. And then, when something goes wrong, it's the conductor's job to spot this and to fix it. And many things can and do go wrong in rehearsal. A section may not be playing together very well. The percussion or the brass may be too loud or people come in early or late or they don't come in it at all, at, at all. Reminds me of the old joke, you know, why do viola players never go to parties? They're always lost. <laughs> yes, it's pretty bad, I know. <laughs> <laughs> viola jokes tend to be. Uh, each piece of, of music has many decisions that have to be made about it. For example, the tempo or speed of the music and how it changes. How fast is allegro? lively, printed on the, the front of so many first movements of classical period works. Is it the same speed in each piece that we see that word written? No, it's not. Other decisions we might make include the subtleties in volume across dozens of musicians. Does forte, loud, mean the same thing to a violinist as it does to a trumpet player? And dynamics aren't just a volume control and a loudness. They have a character or a mood associated to them. Is this piano soft volume tender, or is it intimate, or is it dolce, sweet? Is this forte, loud dynamic, organ-like, or laser-like, blazing, or one letter changed, blaring? The pacing of tension and release through a piece, where does the tension lead to? Where does it resolve itself? These are all decisions we are looking and trying to make. So these are what we investigate while preparing to conduct a piece. Much like painting a picture, the conductor begins with a vision and then executes their craft to the best of their ability to make it real. The orchestra can play without them, but every orchestra member will play it differently. The conductor considers every, oh, don't turn two pages. <laughs> I think I just have. Um, yes, I have, sorry. There it is. Con the conductor considers every aspect of the music and how to make it as inspiring and faithful to the composer's intentions as possible. Then they work with the orchestra to make a unified vision come alive. There's a symbiotic relationship between composer, performer, and audience. Imagination is a key word here. A successful piece of music requires at least three different imaginations and intellects brought together. The composer brings their imagination and craft to the construction and notation of the piece. The performers bring their imagination and craft to the realization of that construction into sound. The listeners, audience, bring their imagination and attention 
to the performance, hopefully allowing the music to take them out of themselves in some way. As I said earlier, if music and the auditory system do not convey representations of objects, and if we can't make translations of any particular piece into English or any other language, then what is a piece of music saying? Well, actually, I think that is the wrong question, and I don't think we should ask it. The best I can do is to perhaps suggest instead that we ask, what does the music arouse within us and let us say to ourselves? And there I go again, that Greek's internal inner experience that Plato was talking about within us. Looking to the far horizon, that title of that 2015 string quartet is rather an apt metaphor for my compositional output, playing the long game and awaiting the arrival of things that seem distant and far away. For many years, that distant horizon was where I looked for, for, for performances and recognitions of my compositional activity. It always seemed to play second fiddle to my teaching, conducting, and other performing activities. And then, in that serendipitous way that life does these things, you find that what was on the horizon has actually snuck up on you, and it's now right under your nose. The last eight years have seen quite a dramatic increase in performances and recordings of my work. I compose at a fairly slow pace, perhaps just two or possibly three works are completed in any year, but most of my work has now seen the light of day through performances and recordings. Anthony's mentioned my concerto Belesca for violin and brass band. It was uh, the idea of our violin lecturer at the time, Kevin Lafon. And it's funnily enough, although it's got this crazy idea of balancing brass instruments and percussion with an acoustic violin, the work's actually been performed in Dunedin, Auckland, Portland in the United States, and recorded in 2009 on a CD uh, as well. I've also written two larger works for orchestra, one of which we'll hear an extract from in a, min in a minute. Two string quartets, three works for symphonic wind band, many chamber works for smaller ensembles. So my music is abstract in the sense that there's no program, no story behind it, other than what I try to evoke, as a, there's that word again, in terms of moods and characters, and then what the listener brings to the music with their imagination and all the associations and resonances that that music might have with them. There's not much mystery about making something from a recipe, but much remains to be said, I think, about the process of originating some new ideas in the form of musical composition. Creation is not just a matter of getting into some sort of excited mental state, as in a brainstorming session, for instance, but it seems to be me to be a much more complex, mysterious process that is in some way, of course, derived from the composer's inner experience and imagination. Composition mixes creativity with craft. Technique is necessary to manipulate ideas, create a structure, make sure that every detail belongs in the work. Imagination and the creative force are the vision and the ideas lying behind the piece, and then these find their outlet in specific melodies, harmonies, and rhythms. As composers, we create a new and innovative recipe for ourselves for each new work. And then we set about cooking, putting together this process of using our experience and understanding to create new works that will hopefully provoke the listener's interest. So I'd like to play you now my final extract uh, from my orchestral work, Huriawa, Prelude and Variations for Orchestra. Composed in 2010 and the beginning of 2011, a scheduled performance in 2012 fell through and the work remained unheard of and unheard until out of the blue it was programmed by the Dunedin Symphony Orchestra in 2018 with a former student, Tequin Evans, conducting. And you will also see my colleagues Tessa Peterson leading the orchestra as concertmaster and Helene de Plassy leading the cellos in this extract. The work is inspired by the Huriawa Pa site on the Karatane Peninsula. The landscape 
cliffs, blowholes, seas and skies. And this extract is from the middle, the heart of the piece. Music is a temporal art. It unfolds over time. And this entails that you listeners do not experience the whole work at once, nor in an order of your choosing. Consequently, the order of presentation is fundamental to the experience of the musical content. And these facts are borne in mind by us composers. We try and create purposeful, goal-directed movement. This extract illustrates this, I hope. Here I take you, the listener, on a journey, beginning with a gentle cluster harmony and a solo oboe, played by my old friend Nick Cornish. Through a growing dialogue with the other woodwind, including Professor Stephen Cranefield on clarinet, who I taught as a lad, funnily enough. And then it grows into a full orchestral tutti, with the theme growing into a more impassioned cello melody. And this is what I mean about the composer directing the listener over time in a purposeful way. In live performance, you have no choice but to experience this music in the order of presentation that I have made with structures and relationships that I develop over time. So going one last time back to the Greeks, let me give you a final example of how I think music reaches those places that words and other things can't describe. One of the most profound musical compositions of the last 100 years is the Couture pour la fin de temps, Quartet for the End of Time, written by French composer Olivier Messiaen in 1940. 
I was lucky enough to perform this piece with Terence and other colleagues in the early 1990s, and I still teach it as a 400 level class and, and use techniques from this work in composition teaching. Messiaen was just 31 years old when France entered the war against Nazi Germany. He was captured by the Germans, uh, imprisoned uh, in a concentration camp where a sympathetic prison guard gave him some manuscript paper and a place to compose, the toilet block. There were three other professional musicians in that camp and Messiaen wrote his quartet with these specific players in mind. It was performed in January 1941 to 4,000 fellow prisoners along with some guards standing in sub-zero temperatures in the freezing winter. Today it is one of the most famous masterworks in the repertoire. Given what we have since learned about life in concentration camps, why would anyone spend their time and energy writing or playing music? Conditions as a captive were horrendous and yet from these concentration camps. We have poetry, we have music, we have visual art. It wasn't just this one fanatic messian. Many, many people created artworks. It begs the question, why? Well, in a place where people only focused on the bare necessities of survival, the obvious conclusion is art and music is essential for life. The camps were without hope, without dignity, without basic respect, but they were not without art and music. Art and music is part of survival. It's part of the human spirit, an unquenchable expression of who we are. The arts are one of the ways in which we say, I am alive and my life has meaning. And this is not just for the producers of art or the performers who bring music and stage arts to life, but it's also necessary for the audiences who receive it. From my own experiences, I've come to understand that music is not a luxury, a lavish thing that we fund from leftovers of our budgets, nor is it a plaything or an amusement or a pastime. Music is actually a basic need of human survival. Music is one of the ways we make sense of our lives, one of the ways in which we express feelings when we have no words, a way for us to understand things with our hearts when we can't with our minds. Music allows us to move around those big invisible pieces of ourselves and rearrange our insides so that we can find an outlet and express what we feel when we haven't the words and can't talk about it. Referencing Plato one last time. I'm a cynic by inclination, but I believe that with music and art, you could yet perhaps even save the planet. If there is to be a future for humanity, if there is to be a settled time of harmony, of peace, of an end to war, of mutual understanding, of quality, of fairness, I don't expect it will come from a government, a military force, or a corporation. It probably won't come from the religions of the world either, which together seem to have brought us as much war as they have peace. If there is a future time of peace for humanity, I expect it might actually come from the composers and artists because we feed that inner soul. And in the end, that's what we've always done, and that's what we always will do. I have been privileged to work with wonderful colleagues. Ours is a vibrant school in performing arts with truly creative people, and I have been very happy here throughout my career. I really want to thank the academic and general staff in the School of Music, Theatre, Performing Arts for all their support collegiality and friendship over the years. I really very much want to thank my family for all their support as well. And finally, my thanks to the university for its support over many years and for showing faith in what I do. It's very much appreciated. And a final shout out to the many musical organizations and musicians here in Dunedin especially, but in other centers that I have worked with. Kiora Tata. Kiora, thank you.
ora koutou, uh, ko Jessica Palmer a hou, uh, ko te manakura o te kite aranui tēnei um, a te whare wānanga o Otago. Um, as my, in my role as the Pro Vice Chancellor of the Humanities, I have the honour of providing the vote of thanks to Professor Adams this evening. And I wanted to start with a personal anecdote, and that is that um, at our graduation ceremonies, I have the pleasure of sitting next to the Pro Vice Chancellor of Sciences. And in one of my first ceremonies as the PVC in that role, just after we had had the pleasure of listening to a musical item from one of the students, who I think in that ceremony was accompanied by um, Professor Terence Dennis, he leaned over to me and whispered, we can't do that in the sciences. <laughs> and several times since, he has emphasised to me and to other members of the university's management team just how important music and the performing arts are. And tonight, Professor Adams, I wanted to recognise the able argument that you put forward that music is both science and humanities and that music doesn't just entertain us and isn't simply about entertainment, but it's far more important than that, that it opens up different ways for us to think and to see the world. It enables us to interact with each other socially, emotionally, and cerebrally. In the first half of your lecture, it was a real pleasure, I think, for all of us to listen to your story of your upbringing and your musical education and how you came to be where you are today. And in the second half of your lecture, you took us more closely into your discipline itself. And you described the art and the science of both the conductor and the composer. And I found what was so interesting in your discussion of both of those roles, a clear call, and I suppose a, a composition of what it is to be an academic in whichever discipline we find ourselves in. So as a conductor, you talked about the skill of the conductor lying in the sensitivity to everything that makes us human. And I think all of us in all of our fields would hope that in some ways we do that too. And perhaps how jealous we are that you get to do it most cleanly. And then as composer, you talked about the composer's role being to evoke ideas and feelings and to reflect the place and time in which the composing is being done. And again, I would say that I hope that's something that all of us as academics and those who are involved in the university find that we are engaged in. I also wanted to just make two points to you, Peter, personally. One is, and I think I say this on behalf of your colleagues as well, how much I appreciate, and I think they appreciate, your commitment to your organisation to be organised, to be thorough, to be unflappable. And I, I note that Professor Ritchie mentioned that in relation to the crucial support you provide the school in course advice and programme leadership. And I just thought I'd share with you that um, IPLs, as we mentioned in the beginning, are a, a regular feature, particularly this year in our calendar. And um, I ask for the draft lecture of each of the IPL um, that I have to, that I have the pleasure of thinking afterwards. And in most of them, it's a bit like a student handing in an assignment. <laughs> <laughs> comes in very late <laughs> and normally very clearly it's draft Jess it's just a draft <laughs> and 99% of the time when I'm listening it certainly was the draft because what was presented <laughs> was not what I got <laughs> which is fine because I end up re I end up getting to read or hear two great <laughs> lectures but in the case of Professor Adams not only did what he give me accurate um, represent almost, almost to, the, to the letter what he delivered to you, but it came in, I think, almost five minutes after the request went out for it. <laughs> so bravo. <laughs> and then secondly, um, I want to pick up on something else you said in your lecture, and that was um, the admiration you have for those who can demonstrate their energy and enthusiasm for music. And... Um, I'm probably giving away too much, but before the lecture, <laughs> Peter was telling us about how frustrating it was to be restricted to a script uh, <laughs> in the way that he normally isn't when he's in front of a class, as many of us are. You know, we can, we can go off script, but in an, in, an, in an event this important, it's really important to have your script with you. And he sort of was expressing how frustrating that was. Well, I wanted to say that regardless of what might have felt like a restriction, Peter, you were nevertheless incredibly entertaining in a good sense, and also, your passion and your enthusiasm came through loudly and clearly. 
And so I'm very jealous of all of your students because I imagine they have a wonderful time. So I want to say, Peter, to you that I'm really glad that at Otago it was decided somewhere in the midst of time that in our university we would seat music and the other performing arts within Te Kese Aranui, the Division of Humanities, even if that makes the PVC Sciences slightly jealous. So thank you. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Peter, for choosing to be a musician, but thank you also for choosing the university path when you could have chosen others, and yet you chose to combine it with uh, your musicianship as well. So nā mihi nui, mō te mahi, me mō te whaikōrero, tēnei pō, um, me whakamihi ki a koe, ahorangi, Peter Adams. Tēnā koe. I have the great pleasure of giving you a small gift as a token of appreciation and remembrance for this evening. Thank you. Congratulations. Very much. Sure. Thank you.